you're, you're interested in a bit of our history about hurricane hunting. Yeah. Um, and Jack has seen most of that. He's been with the hurricane hunters since 1980. Uh, so this is your 41st or 42nd season, Jack? I can't. I, I kind of... It's hard, for me, hard for me to do the numbers, but I think the coming one is number 42. Yeah. That's a long time to do anything. Yeah. Yep. That, that's great. Um, so, Al, if... I can uh, leave them in, in your capable hands. Uh, please, uh, I've given them some background about the Aviationist magazine that you're interested in writing. And, um, you know, if you have any follow-ups, please reach out to me afterwards. I but I'll um, get my ugly face off here so you, Paul, <laughs> and, and Jack can talk about me behind my back. Thank you, John. We, we can't do it without you, John. John, your ugly yeah, no. face makes me look better, so don't go in there. <laughs> <laughs> I need you. Well, nobody looks as bad as me, so don't worry about it. <laughs> Thanks, Jonathan. Yes, sir. Thank you. And thank you, Jack and Paul, for, for your time. No you, no problem. Yeah, thanks, guys, for your time. I really do appreciate it. Um, I guess I'll start with you, Jack. Uh, you have 40-plus years' experience. You're Jack on the blue shark, right? You're both the blue sharks. So it's going to be hard to distinguish. Jack, right, Jack. Um, you have 40-plus years of hurricane hunting seasons under your belt. And that's a lot of information and a lot of knowledge. And I guess I'm interested, I mean, you could Google a lot of different things about this whole hurricane hunting, hurricane research thing, and there's a lot out there. Uh, I guess what I'd like to bring to my people, the aviationist is primarily a pilot-oriented and military-oriented magazine. <coughs> Excuse me. So I would like you to maybe uh, give us some breadcrumbs of knowledge that would be unique that to your experiences. Sure. Well, first of all, I'm not a pilot. I'm a meteorologist, and I like I fly right behind the pilots. I like to say that I get the I get the fun part because I don't have to try to wrestle control of the airplane. I can let them do all that tricky stuff, and I can be right behind them, analyzing the meteorology and saying, "Yeah, let's go left, let's go right, let's you know, what do you think about that track through that sector of the storm?" And they do that for me. So. I am not. I am not. I have no pilot expertise, but we can find you expert pilots to talk about that. No, um, you're you important. Know, my, in the, you're important in the cog in the wheel, though. I mean, honestly, big time. Uh, you, uh, you're the reason the pilots are there, basically. Well, we like to think that uh, they might think otherwise, but no, we like to think <laughs> that. And uh, it's 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 clear that while uh, having their expertise is is you know it couldn't be done with without them. They're, the reason we're going into the center of these storms is for the science and, and for the data. And the data, both in real time and in bringing it home for research purposes for years and years of study ahead, that's the whole reason you put airplanes and people in harm's way. So so we certainly understand the, the critical nature of getting the best science possible. And, uh, you know, we, we never like to say, like, they're just bus drivers up there. But, yes, they are the drivers that get us to those right scientific places. And then we're the people that work with the scientists. We actually have a, a very cool position in the airplane because we are the liaison person between the scientific group that, that are out, uh, you know, kind of give us our reason to go out there. And then the operational people who can get us there and get us back safely. Um, so for 40 years, obviously, things have changed. Do you find things changing year to year or storm to storm? How, how much does the change happen? Well, I was telling telling my boss, Paul, here that uh, that it's changing too fast for me now. That's why I'm rapidly approaching retirement because it changes very quickly on the airplane and uh, some of my synapses don't snap in, in place quite as quick as I'd like them to to catch up with the changes. So I can relate to that. So I, I am hugely <laughs> thankful for new people who are coming along who are a whole lot faster on an iPad than I am and uh, and can bring these new tools into the airplane and make it a whole lot safer. They really do. Uh, uh, it, you know, the, it starts out with the expertise of the pilots and good stick and rudder skills when you absolutely need them. That's really fundamentally what it comes down, down to in extremis. But most of the time it comes down to using your tools properly and honestly, with the sheer number of tools being generated for aviators, you can you can be overwhelmed by them. So knowing the right ones to use at the right time, that's that's really part of the part of the thing that these people bring. And we've just recently hired such smart new people that 
I am, you know, I'm going to be ready to wave when the time comes because uh, it'll be in good hands. He doesn't want you to go. Paul doesn't want you to go. <laughs> I'll add to the commentary that uh, he's absolutely right. Uh, to, to the point, I've been, uh, so I'm, I'm one of the new guys having been uh, here for only 18 years, right? Oh, yeah, you're really <laughs> new. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, but the technology is, is speeding past me, it seems. But uh, technology also uh, has a tendency to fail, and it has a tendency to fail at the wrong times. And the historical understanding and perspective of what we do uh, back when Jack was training me and everything was done on paper. We used to take people, a big piece of paper to read data, and that's how we would write up our reports. And everything is automated now, but you need to know what happens when that automation doesn't work or when it shuts down. And so that historical corporate knowledge to be able to look at the data, look at numbers, and be able to make sure we can continue uh, doing what we need to do is where um, – that that point of view that Jack brings more than anyone, but uh, you know, even even uh, someone getting on the older end and towards retirement like me, uh, being able to recover quickly uh, because, uh, as he mentioned, the iPad or whatever computer uh, you're using stops working or takes such a hit in the plane and, and something goes wrong. You have to know how to react. So we have to train our our new employees on both the technology and that historical ability to work uh, when your tools stop. Uh, just so you guys know, we're, I'm recording this. That's why I'm not taking notes. Don't be great. Uh, <laughs> don't say anything your wife wouldn't want you to hear. Yeah, um, I'll only say nice things. You, you look great, Al. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> we'll keep it clean. We'll keep it clean. Yep. One of the things that I, in my visit, it was a great visit to Noah. I went there with my assistant. It was also my wife, and she was fantastic. Uh, one of the things that really interested me was the use of drones, the, the upcoming use of drones. I believe it's new this season. Mm. Not completely. Not completely. The military is currently oh. using drone technology also, as we all know. Uh, and one of their more interesting methods that they're getting involved with is drone swarming. And that is where drones go out in mass. When I say in mass, 5, 10, 15, 20 drones at the same time, they all communicate with each other and they create a net of information gathering whatever, intelligence gathering information. Uh, I think that would be great for hurricane research too. If you guys are already deploying drones in the hurricanes, deploy multiple drones. Is, do you guys have any possibility or think you might be doing that? Shoot, Paul. Yeah, well, so our requirements are driven from our customers. It's sort of the demand from the outside that, that uh, we react to from, from uh, as a center. And so there's no doubt uh, we, uh, we have uh, hit experience that has happened that has forced us to have to look at um, going the route of using uh, UASs as we call them or drones. Uh, I was on one flight uh, way back in Hurricane Isabel uh, where uh, we were flying as low as we could just on the outside the, uh, of the eye wall and we ended up having some engine difficulty. We lost an engine in flight. You were in a P3? Uh, yeah, on the P3. It was Category 5. Um, you know, in Hurricane Isabel. And how and about, well, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but what was your altitude? Oh, uh, gosh, we were flying down as low as uh, 400 feet, maybe even a little bit lower than that. Wow, that's yeah, incredible. Just the end of the and uh, it might have been meant two. Uh, Jack, do you recall for sea blast? Was it two? Oh, you guys went down at least at least as low as that, maybe even 100 feet. Yeah, so it was... Yeah, uh, it was low depth of sense, you know, so dramatic. you had a really low wow. between the bands. Yeah. yeah, so it wasn't a lot of fun. And uh, so we ended up having a uh, compressor stall on engine three, you know, flames, uh, shut down the engine, uh, you know, took a direct route back to, to St. Croix, but of course the direct route going sort of along an eye wall, right? Cause you can't really go direct. So um, we were fine, but uh, it made us, uh, you know, the post analysis made us realize we can't be putting uh, our, our aircraft down that low. And so that really back then was when, when that, that critical point of realizing the science was still needed, but we couldn't do it, right? We do a lot, right? We do a lot, but we couldn't do that. And so uh, that sort of on our end forced from our science side, uh, they said, well, we need some way to gather that information because we've, we've realized it's critical. How are we going to get it? So then the talk of drones or UASs came into play. And of course, in parallel, just as you mentioned in the military using it, even uh, local law enforcement, uh, a lot of them are using them now. And so in parallel, our needs have gone up as well. And as our customers have looked at that as an option, they've sort of banged on the door and asked for more. Are you and so, 
Are yeah, you considering full size drones or are you still the mini drones? Uh, right now, everything is mini. Uh, I haven't heard Jack. Have you heard any talk about anything larger than that? I haven't, at least not that's been passed down to me. Not since the latest uh, NASA slash NOAA Global Hawk went out of service just due to age and aging out. Uh, and there's there continues to be talk every year. But presently, what we're discussing, at least in terms of the hurricane, is something that would be uh, relatively small and launched from a P3 mothership. Yeah. Interesting. Um, now, the, the when you went down to 200 feet, that was in which P3? Do you remember? Gosh. Um... Pick one, Paul. Yeah. <laughs> you only have two. Right, it's 50-50. <laughs> uh, you know, I don't know if I was on um, 42 or 43. Uh, something kind of tells me I was on 43. Though, did you have a cake I... bouncing in front of you, or did you have Kermit bouncing in front of you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Who, was, who was dancing up front? Uh, uh, I could get you that information. I, I don't recall. I would really like that. I think it was 43. And do you remember what year that was? Isabel was 2000 and... Oh, Isabel. Isabel, I'll find out. No, three, 2003. Okay, uh, that's honestly, you guys are, are very science oriented and primarily it's, it's science, 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 and that's great. I mean, I went to college for marine biology. I've been a pilot since I was 19 years old. Been involved with aviation all my life. I've been working with the aviationist for more than I can even remember, years. I primarily do illustrations and photography, uh, but I had this idea to do this article for NOAA, and what I plan to do is it's gonna be, as, hopefully I've got the okay, to do a series of articles regarding the Lakeland Linder Airport. Uh, there's a lot going on at Lakeland Linder Airport, so my plan is to do NOAA first. The article for NOAA should be coming out within one to two weeks, including an illustration. Uh, I'm going to send you guys, uh, it's going to be a, 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 like a pilot plan view illustration of a P3. If you guys have a P3 you'd rather see one over the other, let me know. Um, and then we're going to go ahead and we're going to do an Amazon Prime uh, article because Amazon Prime is huge in Lakeland Linder. Uh, and then I'm going to try and go and get a hold of the attack guys there at Lakeland that are flying the uh, aggressor aircraft. Then we're going to do an article on Sun and Fun. And, or Lakeland Linder Airport itself, and it's going to culminate to the 2022 Sun and Fun Air Show. So that's the long-term goal with this, and you guys are the first step in this idea, <laughs> and I think it's going to be pretty cool. It's going to get some great publicity. You guys are going to have a presence at the air show next year, and this could really work hand-in-hand -hand with what's going on. And, and not to mention, this is all going to be funneled through the aviationist who's probably the largest military aviation publication in the world. They're based out of Rome, Italy. It's a big deal, and I'm really excited about everything that's going on. And it's fantastic to talk to both of you guys today. Uh, I'm not going to lie. I'd like to down the line. I know the COVID thing has really screwed things up, uh, but I would love, if there's any way possible, uh, to go on a flight into a storm. I mean, I, I'm a retired law enforcement. I have good background and decent health. Uh, and if that is ever in the future possible, I, and I would report on that, both visually and obviously through the aviations. So, you know, I know it, to you guys it's something that's part of the job, right? It's nothing that you really love to do. Do you, do you, do you stress over it? Do you like say, oh, I got to fly in the storm and do you get nervous about it? Or how do you feel about it when you go up into a storm? I trust more about these the things than I do flying. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know, what do you think, Jack? Oh, I don't know. I think a, a, I think a, a certain amount of stress is a very healthy thing in that particular environment. Absolutely. And, uh, in any number of cases where where my uh, clench factor has been conveyed nicely to the pilots and they were having about the same reaction to what they saw ahead and we thought of a, maybe a slightly more prudent way to do what we were doing. So, so it, I think it's a very important part of the job. It's a healthy thing. Yeah. Now, when you when you started, were you flying up in P twos? No. no, I started with the P threes. Strangely, enough, it just was one of those uh, coincidences that when I started working for the HRD for Hurricane Research Division uh, down in Miami, they needed uh, a, a meteorologist who was radar trained, which was my Coast Guard background, and uh, 
and they had just gotten the P-3 aircraft. So I just missed the DC-6 era, and at that time, the P-3s were two and three years old, and we also had an old C-130 uh, Bravo model. Uh, and that, so really, I started on the P-3s, and they were brand new, and kind of what Paul is describing was the end of an era when we thought that the planes were indestructible because they were relatively new and so much more powerful for the weight than the old DC-6s. But honestly, it was a few bad experiences we had with what you call our overconfidence that we became more prudent and we started to figure out some better ways to solve some things that we used to just solve by bludgeon method, going at a thousand feet in a Cat 5 eyewall or something like that. So uh, that being said, Charlie, was a small. I'm not going to take much of your time, guys. Time up. You're That's okay. That's, we're good. We're fine. Uh, we're good. Charlie was my my wife and I both. We uh, are amateur meteorologists. We love it. We track storms. I mean, we're we're into this a lot, and this is really exciting for us. Uh, Charlie was an intense small storm that hit Punta Gorda, and it. I, I heard some figures to the fact that it had something like 168 tornadoes in its eyewall. I don't know if that's exaggerated. It wouldn't surprise me. It had a tiny eye, and the tiny eyes have the little mesovortices on the inside edge of them that often engender tornadoes. Yeah, and and that's what um because there was only one airplane, as far as I know, that was ever certified to fly into a thunderstorm and possibly a tornado, and that's the F one hundred six. That's the T twenty. The South Dakota School of Mines T twenty eight used to harbor plated T twenty eight used to fly through thunderstorms. Didn't even have a radar. They just got vectored by ground radar. But uh, I think it went out of service a while back. I bet it did. No. Um, <laughs> so when you fly into hurricanes, you're going to have the possibility of flying into a tornado, or do you radar vector around something like that? Can you see that on your radar? We wish we could. We can see we can see evidence or radar shapes that are taught to all prudent aviators as far as hooks and donuts and things like that. And we know a lot about radar shadows. And so among other things, there's a certain amount of, at least in the hurricane environment, there's a certain amount of safety and altitude. So you might fly across a mesovortex that that down lower could drop a tornado. But generally the mesovortex at our altitude is, is broad enough that while it might jolt the airplane around a little bit, it's not gonna be quite as thin as flying through a tornado. Right, it's not as intense as, as the sea level or ground level vortex would yep. be. It's very yep. interesting. Yeah, they're very low level features where a Midwest tornado, of course, would be uh, stacked up for, you know, many, many tens of thousands of feet. So, sorry, you know, 10,000 feet. So, uh, and these, these are very, where they're scientifically known to be very low level features. And so, uh, as Jack Messon mentioned, that uh, altitude is safety in that situation. So, if we have any hint of an eye wall that's strong enough to uh, support these features, we go up. And then, of course, uh, we are looking down with our radar as well. And if we see any type of hook features, we're probably still going to act like it's right on our path, even if we believe it's below. So we're going to take a little bit of a detour and uh, find a slightly easier way to get through. Um, we already have our first name storm. Yep. Specific, right? Yep. It was specific, tell me. I, I ignored my phone over the weekend. It was Andre? <laughs> Andre. Andre. Um, yep. That's and uh, I was told that the National Hurricane Service is now starting reporting at May fifteenth, where they're mm -hmm. going to have every four hour reporting. Uh, yep. But that doesn't mean the hurricane official hurricane season is going to move from uh, June first to May fifteenth. Does it mean that? Maybe someday. Um, yeah, they're always talking yeah. about. Yeah, but we we have uh, we've flown storms sooner than June first. Yeah, last year they they started popping up pretty early, yep. and uh, yep. this is a Pacific storm. So I think yep. whenever you start having Pacific storms, I think that's a good sign because the more Pacific right. storms there are, the less Atlantic storms. It seems that way over the it years I've been following it, right? So hopefully yep. that's going to be a good thing for us. Uh, is there anything you guys would like to add to this? Because this has been a really fantastic conversation. I would say one thing with pilots, uh, since you were mentioning your, your target audience, um, you know, the unique thing, and Jack hit on a little bit early on in talking about why about our role on the airplane, is as you can imagine, when you train a, uh, you know, generically train a pilot, um, you're, tr you're training them to pretty much uh, avoid everything that we're asking the pilots to fly into. And one of the big things that we have to do, uh, almost as a translator, is take a two-dimensional radar image and and use our meteorological knowledge of what we're seeing to make it three dimensions, so that we can see. 
um, uh, have a different perspective on what's out there. So where as a pilot, you might immediately go to avoid, um, you know, 50 or 40 DBZs for lower DBZs. For us, it may be the opposite. We may be vectoring towards higher DBZs because of what we're seeing on the radar and what we understand with the development of the system we're looking at. So um, we don't, uh, as meteorologists uh, on these aircraft, of course we still look at DBZs. They're, they're critical for our decision making, but it's not the tool, it's one tool. We may actually go through higher DBZs uh, as I like to uh, mention it to, to new pilots, if you can imagine a uh, gradient, just how quickly you go from green to yellow to red, be really simple. And if you imagine it as a mountain, if it's a very steep gradient, the mountain looks like this. If it's a very shallow gradient, it looks like that. We can fly through those shallow gradients all day long, even in the tropics, even at 50 dBZs without much of a problem. But I won't take you through a 40 dBZ cell that's shaped like this. Right, so uh, it's taking that next level of radar understanding that meteorologists learn on the ground and bringing it to the uh, flight station. And it's that teamwork, that combination uh, that allows us to succeed. So it, speaking of pilots, I mean, I've tried not to get too aviation oriented on this, but it's hard not to. Uh, what do you look for in potential pilots? I know you, you have a good open service for the services, like you go with the Navy or whatever, And but are you looking for a specific uh, qualification or experience in, in pilots? You want to take that one, Jack? Or? Sure, sure. Um, with, I mean, when it comes to the, to the heavy aircraft that do the hurricane flying, one of the really good things to have is someone who really knows the platform, even though they don't know the platform in the weather. Uh, so, so what we've had the luxury of over many, many decades is the experience of like Navy trained P3 drivers who come over to us. And then as Paul was, uh, did a better job of explaining than I would, they were taught in the Navy, they get within 200 miles of a hurricane, they fly the other way. We say, no, nope, you go this way when you, when you fly for NOAA. But then we get into the subtleties of flying that particular kind of weather. Well, it's really nice to not have to worry about training that person on that particular platform at the same time we're trying to teach the subtleties Absolutely. of the weather. So you can imagine that and, and a nice progression that they have here at, at NOAA, even with our relatively small fleet, we're down to now only four different uh, types. And so you will you will typically cycle through either our Twin Otters or our uh, uh, King Air fleet and get the multi-engine instructor pilot instrument rating, of course. Uh, and then you can, you can move your way up to uh, the twin engine G4 or the four engine P3s and, and we're, we're going to lose that Navy link of the P3 drivers, but we'll still do pretty well by the NOAA progression. And that's some, those are, those are again, things that we look for. And also because they've done the environmental science kind of work with the rest of our fleet, they know what it's like to work with scientists. They know what it's like to get out there and do science with an airplane. So now we just, now we're dealing with severe weather science, which is another added element to it. Uh, do you have, um, no, go I was going to say, if I, if I could add in a big thing, which, which you'll understand, and it's easier today than even it was 20 years ago, is uh, one thing that's critical is, is CRM, resource management. And, you know, 20 years ago, when you look back, you, you, you could sense what wasn't being trained as well for a lot of pilots, which now, of course, it's, you have it more because we're trained. We train everyone in it so much. Um, but that's key. It, it, in the type of environment we fly, we can't have a one-person leader who thinks they are coming into this not natural environment, um, whether it's from another service or, or even uh, you know just getting local aviation and coming into our organization, um, they have to have strong CRM skills because yeah, there's too too many things coming from different directions that are all critical and they're all fast and uh, it, you need a lot of trust. You know, you need all you go right down the line of all the things that you need, commu good communications, everything, and so. Uh, that's critical for our pilots, uh, so they don't just uh, they they are the only uh, person to be making a certain decision at the right time. I, I got fortunate to get aligned with a, a Facebook group, and it's an aviation accident Facebook group. And the guy is, I mean, if if an airplane lands off off runway, he covers it. If every aviation accident that you can imagine, even incidents, this guy really covers it. I think he's out of Spain or someplace, but I'll tell you what. And I have really gotten an interest. 
I mean, if I could have a dream job right now, I would probably be an accident investigator for the NTSB. What a fascinating job. The reason I bring this up is because co cockpit resource management is often a problem that leads to aviation accidents. And I can only imagine, if you're flying in a hurricane, anything like that, you're gonna, you, know, you have bad cockpit resource management. If the co-pilot's not talking to the pilot, not talking to the weather people, I mean, I can only imagine how bad that could get fast. You know, so I can see the teamwork there really would be important. Um, one yep. question. Now, do you guys, does NOAA have its own uh, deal where they want to bring somebody up through the ranks as a pilot? Uh, do they do their own training from the get-go, from initial flight training mm -hmm. on up through the ranks to be one of their pilots? Yes, you, there is there is a method for that. Yes, we have we call them homegrown. So we have both our inner service transfers and our homegrown pilots. <clears throat> Where does that take place? Um, I know they go to Vero Beach. Jack, do you know is there any others that you know of over time? Hasn't been others that's the, that's really the more re most recent thing, and because and, and it's where you where you tag into either John to explain it or or even uh, uh, even uh, Commander Sloan. The the pilots are all in the NOAA Corps. And they all do the basic NOAA core training. And then a lot of them go out and do a tour on the ship, and that gets them used to working with scientists and the, and the NOAA science mission. But there are even a few that are such promising aviators that they send them immediately, as Paul said, to, to flight training over in Vero Beach. I, I forget the name. Maybe it's called flight training. I don't know. But yeah. uh, and, and, they're, and they're just taking, you know, from the very beginning, ground school, regular old, uh, like any other, I guess, private pilot, but then they very rapidly evolve through that and all the other ratings to, to make them homegrown enough to be able to jump on one of our twin otters and our otters go up and, you know, the, the first posting will be up to Minneapolis, St. Paul. They'll be, uh, they'll be dealing with uh, winter up in Minneapolis, St. Paul, so you better not send somebody too fresh in the pilot yeah. pit. But at that point, they will... They will get a lot of seat of the pants training, and then, like Paul said, one of the, the one of the biggest changes that kind of it almost snuck up on me in my time was that both before and after we have a, a really really busy hurricane season, there'll be an awful lot of meetings and CRM discussions in advance, uh, uh, operational risk management ORM sessions, getting ready for it, and then there'll be the hot washes the. Uh, the, the debriefs afterwards. So we'll say, gee, this is where it really didn't go right this year. And man, let's not do that again next year. And honestly, in the good old days, we did do it over and over again. We did it wrong uh, and and rarely learn from our mistakes. That is something that has really changed a lot. I was uh, fortunate enough to have worked with the Blue Angels for a year. I was a civilian subcontractor. I did marketing and went on tour with them. And it was one of the more interesting things I've done in my life. And I really got to know how they worked. And one of the biggest things in their organization is the debrief. Uh, they would fly yep. two and three air shows a day sometimes in practice. And the debrief was very important. They criticized, self-criticized. And it's important that you have somebody that has the ability <clears throat> to self-criticize. And that's the only way they can improve and not be dangerous or ineffective in the future. So that's really an interesting thing. Uh, one thing I was wondering, you, so you don't have a co-op with like Emory Riddle or something like that? You just, it's, it's haphazard kind of wherever they want to get their training done or? I, I think the main, I think, the, well, the, I think the biggest thing is that they, they, the NOAA Corps officers, they come from various uh, university and other backgrounds. We had one that's a recent uh, Emory Riddle graduate, but they apply to the NOAA Corps system. Okay. And they get accepted as a commissioned officer in the Corps. And then at that point, they bring with them whatever their background was, including there could be any number of uh, aeronautical schools where they would become rather obviously, hey, you're a future aviator for us. The reason I'm going along this short line of questioning or uh, anyway, is uh, I'm going to include in the article uh, is for there are any pilots out there that might be interested in getting involved mm -hmm. with NOAA. I mean, who would be best to talk to for that? There's a recruiting office for NOAA. There is? Okay. Yeah, for the for NOAA Corps. Yeah, there's a recruiting office. Oh. You, you can go, I mean, I could Google it or you could Google it. Yeah, you okay. have like NOAA Corps recruiting. Fantastic. Um, okay. And then I think John Shannon also would, would be told by the uh, command here who to suggest to you to, to get the most details on that. Okay. 